Sylvester Center. They have one room that's looped, and the, that's the lip reading class. Um, a lot of the audiologists and hearing aid dispensers have a loop in their office that you can try with your hearing aids. That's a good thing. Um, so, are we done passing? You need, you need a device? No, I just have a question. Sure. Anybody um, else? Okay. You still need a microphone, even though you have a hearing, because I know I have a hard time understanding people because they, they talk fast. They don't have to speak what you do. You know. <coughs> The hearing loop works, uh, the hearing loop is connected to a PA system, a sound system, an audio system. So <coughs> when it's hooked up, like here, anytime you come in this room, there are other meetings that happen in this room, but if they're using this microphone, the hearing loop is automatically on. Okay? So, okay, so I want to introduce you to uh, uh, Fariba. Uh, Fariba is from Costco in Irvine, the hearing aid dispenser, and she brings the cookies every week. So go have a And uh, so let's get them go to Anne. Okay. Everybody's getting an amber yeah. alert on their phone about oh the fires. Oh. That can turn it off. It doesn't. You can't. Okay. What's well, a good idea if you could turn your you can't. This one. Yeah, I know. So uh, Anne Mundell Noel, um, she is the audiology advisor for the Hearing World Club. She's been with me almost from the very beginning, and we work um, away from the meetings. We we have meetings of our own uh, to help set up these these meetings. She. Will, uh, when she's here at the meeting, she'll talk to you. you can, she'll answer your questions. So that's why we invite you to come a little early so that um, you, can, you can ask her questions. Okay, let me, we have some microphones here. So this is Anne. Anne, thank you. Okay, I'm not sure if we're taking questions now or you're going to wait. Come in. Okay, come you have a question about it? Yeah. help with that, uh, I don't wear hearing aid and you have uh, given me this to use. I tested it out while you were talking. It works beautifully. And I am so sorry why we don't, uh, each one of us should already have it. Because quite often microphone doesn't work. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. She's talking about the T-coil. She's wearing the headset with the coil. So if anybody is not hearing well in the meeting, we have a couple more headsets. So if you're not hearing Tony well, we can get you one. So Rick, would you please come up here? Okay. So Rick is a loop installer. He installed the loop in this room. He installed the boardroom. He installed Clubhouse 2. And the towers, I forgot about the towers. Yes, the towers in their activity room there. And, uh, and we want to put more loops in the village. Uh, Clubhouse 5 is a good place, uh, Clubhouse 7. Uh, it's up to you, you got to ask for it. Talk to the Clubhouse supervisors and tell them that you're interested in that. I'm, I'm going to work with management and try to get some movement. Rick, though, is, uh, he also did uh, Geneva Presbyterian Church, Church of the Masters. Uh, so he's doing all the looping in the area. Several members here also have their TV room looped. When you experience how crystal clear this is, wouldn't it be wonderful to listen to, to your TV at home, crystal clear and not bothering your neighbors? <laughs> you don't have to turn the, the uh, the TV up really loud. And Rick does that. So there are cards, and he's here to talk to him. He provided the loop listeners today, and so he's just been a wonderful sponsor. Lots of time. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Rick. I also have to talk to you about Caption Call. Caption Call doesn't have a representative here, but Caption Call regularly pays for our court reporter, uh, Laura, who's sitting over here. And um, 
And so we appreciate Caption Call. A lot of people in this room know me because I installed their Caption Call phone years ago. I haven't worked for them for four years, so I'm, I'm, I'm not an employee now. Um, caption Call, it actually captions everything the caller is saying. Requirements, you have to have the internet. You have to have a landline phone. And your hearing loss has to be certified by a hearing health care provider or it could be a medical uh, provider. And I have those forms here. If you're interested, there is absolutely no charge for this phone. And the service is paid for through a program with the federal government, part of the ADA. <laughs> so we have professionals in the room. If you're interested in getting this phone, the first step is to get this form signed on your behalf. And also have a little application form. And if you do it on your own, just tell them the Hearing Well Club uh, sent you so that they will keep paying the bills here. That would be nice. <laughs> Okay, um, do we have any other professional advisors? Uh, I mean, a professional um, hearing aid dispensers? No, nobody else here, okay. We usually have more. Um, how many people are here for the very first time? Okay, good. Oh, good. Good, 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 good. Um, hearing loss is a leading public issue. <laughs> By age 80, 70, uh, 75 to 80 percent have some level of hearing loss. The National Institutes for Health actually says that age 75 and older, 50 percent have hearing loss. So that means 50 percent of Laguna Woods residents has some level of hearing loss. Mm. Yeah, isn't that surprising? Okay. Um, so hearing loss is a daily challenge, but it can be overcome, and that's what we try to do here. Um, so you don't have to face your hearing loss alone. So a lot of people say, well, I think I have a hearing loss. What do I do? Coming to meetings here, you can talk to other people about their experience. You can talk to me. I'll kind of guide you in the right direction, and you'll be well taken care of. Uh, educated consumers here better. So there's lots to learn. Okay, and I want to thank my volunteers, Susan, Marilyn, Paul, Treasurer, Elaine, Secretary, all around Daniel, <laughs> um, Lisa, and Natalie. Uh, they, they put everything together, thank you. Thank you volunteers. Okay. Uh, we meet on the second Tuesday of every month, so mark your calendar in advance. I actually, uh, Paul has at the reception desk, our treasurer Paul, has some little stickers that if it would help you, you can put these on your calendar, put it on the second Tuesday of the month, so that you will be reminded in advance and you won't accidentally schedule another appointment. So, Because I've had a lot of people say, oh, I didn't know I... Scheduled appointments, so I didn't make it. Okay, um, membership is fifteen dollars per household, and membership is January through December. Uh, when you join, you don't get a membership card; you get a name tag. And so, some of you are wearing name tags that are already printed out. That's because you're a member. Um, also, there's been a lot of talk about room rates, clubs, and room rates. And I believe the room rate is going up 18%. So I haven't got it, the word yet from the recreation office. We have a big donation can up there. I really, I, I don't ask for donations very often. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a little bit more nagging about that. But I really do need your support, both in membership and donations, to help uh, keep everything going, including the increased room rents. Um, October schedule of events for the Hearing Well Club. We actually are very, very busy this month. In addition to this meeting, on October the 16th, we have an iPhone training class. It's already full. It's already full. Um, 
We had some people that signed up for that, and um, they are now on the November class. So November class is November the 20th, and it looks like I have seven openings. So I have this sheet if you would like some basic training for your iPhone. This, this is a program that's provided by the California Telephone Access and it's for seniors with hearing loss. So, and the goal, and the outcome at the end is so that you can hear better on your phone. They are not teaching Android at this time. Uh, they hope to be able to do that in the new year. But for right now, if you have an iPhone and you could benefit from a little training on your iPhone, there's six people in a class and you'll have two or three trainers per class. So it's very hands-on, very one-on-one. -on -one. And if you'd like to sign up, I'm going to start passing this around, OK? Please make sure that it gets to the reception desk at the end. Oh, boy, more Amber Alerts. It's probably about the fires. OK. Um, that's October, October the 22nd. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, that's this, that sign up is for November, November the 20th. Yeah, okay. I interrupted myself. Um, October the 22nd, Hearing Well Club is going to be at the Senior Village Games. Come by and see me, 1130 to 2, Clubhouse 2. So if you're going to be at the Village Games, we'll have a little table there and some little giveaways or something. So stop by and see me. Um, October the 28th, this is... Um, uh, in recognition of Audiology Awareness Month, we have a special meeting. Um, Anne Mundell Noel will be presenting on the newest technology in hearing aids and how to maximize the use of the aids you have now. And you have to sign up for it. There's only 30 seats. That's all the, whole, the room holds, 30 seats. So I'm going to pat, I have another sign up sheet. A two. Okay. All right. There's three people already on this list. So uh, if you want to come, this is going to be in the Pine Room in the Community Center on the 25th, 2 o'clock. So I have one for this side of the room and. I, ran, I don't have a pen. I have another one for this yeah. side of the room. Can I get a pen? Yeah. Thank you, Judy. All right. We'll just start it over here. Okay. Okay, we're winding down now. Um, the next meeting is November the 14th. And that's the second Tuesday of the month, and it's at two o'clock. And I'm, I'm gonna um, introduce Paul now <laughs> and get his presentation ready. Um, so Paul Sanchez is here today uh, from the Department of Consumer Affairs. In particular, he he reigns over the. This is a long word. Speech pathologist audiologists, and hearing aid dispensers board. And I heard somebody call that the slop happy board. <laughs> Have you heard that? Sometimes it feels that way. Yeah, sometimes it feels that way. Okay. So th that was the hearing aid dispensers that were, yes. that was at their convention. They were calling it the slop happy board. Okay. Um, so uh, Paul is here. He's going to be talking to you. I'm, I'm sure you read the advertisements that we put out uh, about uh, licensing of professionals, education, continuing education. Um, he has some things um, to tell you that I'm not even aware of. And so but I'm just going to let him get started. And Paul, why don't you come on up here and I will go to the computer and get your thing going. And this is forward and backwards okay. once I get it going. Okay. How much 
Thank you, Tony. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Paul Sanchez. Um, let me see if I, as I get situated here, I see that you're all getting Amber alerts, and one of the reasons that we're here, we're here to see. Oh, I'm sorry. One of the reasons we're here is to see all of you and talk about what we do, but we were also here to actually visit one of my sons who was playing soccer in Southern California. When he got back to Santa Rosa, uh, went to bed, thought it was going to be a normal evening, going to get ready for his everyday weekend routine, and calls us. We're at the Ayers Hotel to tell us there's these horrible fires in Santa Rosa. So, you know, Phil, for all these people all over Northern California, Southern California that have just lost so much, so much devastation. So our hearts go out to those people right now. Um, let me... Tony is very technological, probably even more so than I am, because she figured this out right away. So let me go ahead and get started and talk about why I'm, why I'm here. Back in 1992, during the vice presidential debates, Admiral Stockdale asked a question. He said, who am I and why am I here? And I always think about that whenever I get up in front of people, who am I and why am I here? The interesting thing is, while they were asking him questions, people thought he was aloof because he couldn't hear the questions. And if you recall, one of the reasons he couldn't hear the questions was because his hearing aid wasn't on. And he said, I'm sorry, can you repeat? My hearing aid isn't on. So a couple of reasons that I'm here is to talk about hearing aids. Now, I never thought growing up, I thought I dreamed of being a lot of things. I talked to Daniel Boone earlier, and I watched a lot of television, so I used to fantasize about being the Lone Ranger, an astronaut, a baseball player. I never thought I would be running a licensing board and overseeing the profession of speech language pathology, audiology, and hearing aid dispensing. But as I became more and more involved in consumer protection issues, I began to realize how incredibly important it is what I do for a living. I'm married to a, this lovely woman here, Lisa Sanchez, my wife, who actually her job is really interesting. As we're driving through here, she sees a lot of the hospitals and skilled nursing facilities. Lisa's job was to inspect and enforce the, those facilities were safe and up to code for their residents. So somehow we both ended up in the consumer protection business and that's what I do. So we're responsible for regulating hearing aid dispensing, audiology, speech language pathology. I'm gonna go through some statistics just to kind of give you a background, but I don't wanna bore you with a lot of information, so I'll be sure not to do that. Our board is made up of professional licensees and public members. We meet four times a year and we exist for consumers. That's why we exist. We're not just a government agency taking people's tax dollars, we actually get our money from licensee registrations. The licensees that are here, they send us a fee, we put that money to work, and we run a very tight ship. We have Tony Berrien, who I, I appreciate everything she does. She's very involved in consumer protection issues from another side. And we've seen um, this very kind woman come to our board meetings and remind us, you are, he you are about hearing and you don't even have a hearing loop so that people that, <laughs> that have problems hearing can hear what you're talking about. So we've got a ways to go, but we're very grateful for the input that we've gotten from, from Tony, some of the issues that she's raised to the board, and our, our board members are very interested in pursuing those issues. Our board oversees, you'll see later, about 27,000 licensees in California. 
We license 27,000 people, yet we only have 10 employees that work in the board office. So we have a big job ahead of us, and, and we, we're very busy. We work with law enforcement agencies. We have sworn peace officers. We have the attorney generals. Uh, we have district attorneys in different counties that we also work with. What does a licensing board do? Well, obviously it, it licenses. And, you know, I hear a lot of sometimes uh, there's some negative sentiment about regulations and, and licenses. We have too many regulations and we have too many licenses. Well, one of the things we do is we keep people safe. We want to make sure that people are protected and that people are, are, are able to live a life happy, uh, avoiding problems. For, for seniors, two of the greatest expenses you're going to have is probably buying an automobile and purchasing a hearing aid. So it's really important that we make sure that that's done properly. So we promote standards through the legislative process, through regulations. We make sure that the laws are there to protect people. And we also have enforcement. So when, when licensees or people that are not practicing by the law are abiding by the law, we enforce the law. And I'll give you an example of something that we have done recently. There was a large hearing aid retailer in Northern California. Um, some Used some bait and switch tactics. Advertising a $600 hearing aid. Come on in and buy the $600 hearing aid. When people would come in to buy a $600 hearing aid, they would be told, they were told, that's not the right hearing aid from, for you. So a nun, we had a nun that was one of, one of the victims of this case, walked into one of these places. You know, she was not able to spend her own money. She had to take an invoice back to the diocese. And while she was there, she was pressured into buying a more expensive hearing aid. She said in her Irish accent, no, no, I can't even do it like she did it. But she said, I, I've only been authorized to spend $1,200. She was told she was going to spend $1,200 um, to bring the invoice back to the diocese. She was pressured into a credit transaction where she had to sign on for credit. She ended up spending 10 times that amount of money for hearing aids that didn't work for her. Now, that was a very unfortunate thing for her. She was so distraught that she stayed at a motel right outside because she was afraid to go back to the diocese. That, those are the kinds of cases that we investigate. I will say this, out of the 27,000 people that we, that we license, most of our licensees are, are very good, dedicated, committed people. But there are those few that we have to watch a little more closely and sometimes take action against. In this particular case, the, the company had to give restitution to all of the people that made refund claims. Because there are some laws that protect you when you're buying the hearing aids, some unique and special laws that were written just for hearing aids. And I'll, I'll cover that a little more as we go along. Why do we need a licensing board? We have licensing boards um, for, for contractors. We have licensing boards for, for dentistry. You probably all have heard of the medical board. Um, we have licensing boards for, for many, many things. And the reason we need a licensing board is because the legislature, the state of California, decided that certain professions affect the, the overall public health and safety of California citizens, and these professions need to be subject to regulation and control. Uh, one of the big ones is a contractor state licensing board. If those contractors are not regulated, then, then maybe the contractors aren't doing things to code and doing things safely. So these things, these same uh, laws apply to hearing aid dispensers, audiologists, and speech language pathologists. So that's why we exist. That's why we have to license people. I, I would never want to be in a country where there were no regulations or there were no licenses and people were victims of unscrupulous actors in, in these cases. So I'm very glad that we have these laws in California. Now, when the board was established, the board was established with a main priority. And that priority wasn't to collect money from people. The priority wasn't to, to do anything above consumer protection. So that's what, that's what we stand for. Everything that we do, we think about it from a consumer protection standpoint. 
If we don't agree with something as a board or as an organization, we go back to that, why are we here? Who are we? Why are we here? We're here to protect consumers. A licensure authorizes an individual to practice their profession. It's governed by state laws and regulations. Licensees are required to maintain a minimum standard of practice. And it's a privilege that must be earned or maintained. I talk to licensees all the time and they don't understand why are you coming down so hard on us? Why are you, why are you doing this to us? You know, I, I already paid my dues. Maybe they, they get arrested or they commit a crime. And I tell them, as a licensee, you are held to a higher standard than average Joe or average Jane citizen. You have to maintain a higher standard to keep your license. So that's why we have these laws. Now, it's really important whenever you go to, a, to buy hearing aids or, or wherever you go that you know exactly who you're talking to. When you walk into a hearing aid dispensing uh, retail location, know who it is. Sometimes the person helping you, are, are, they a hearing, are they a licensed hearing aid dispenser? Are they an audiologist? Are they a, a trainee? Because you have a right to know who's, who's holding that transaction with you, who's helping you, and what their qualifications are. One thing that we can do, one of the, one of the great things that the Department of Consumer Affairs has is something called license verification. And many of you may, may have already used this, you may know about this, but anytime you're dealing with a licensee, you can look them up on our, on our website and you can find out if they have actions, disciplinary actions that have been taken against them. And that's something that Senator Hill brought up in, in these, in these uh, reviews of, of boards. When the legislature reviews a board every four years, he wants to know, do consumers know if they go see a doctor that this doctor has had disciplinary action against him, do consumers know when they go to, to purchase a hearing aid that perhaps this hearing aid dispenser has had action taken against him? So that's something that you can do. In one of the booklets that we've left you here, there's information on how to look for license verification. This is just something you can look at on your own. This just tells you how many licensees are in the state of California. And just to confuse you more, we threw up more numbers in a box, and these are, this is interesting data for you to know. The number of licensees we have in California and the number of complaints that we get. As you can see, out of almost 28,000 people, we get, a, we get about 200 complaints. Not all of the, those complaints are valid complaints. Sometimes they're just people that are angry about the way they were treated. We're here only to actually, actually uh, enforce the laws that exist. So it has to be a violation of, of the law when we step in. One thing Tony asked me to talk about is the, the education that the requirements for licensure. So two types of people can dispense hearing aids in California. Now that may change somewhat, but there are still laws that say that to fit to create an ear mold depression and to, to sell a hearing aid, you must be licensed in the state of California. We have some, we have some of the most strict licensing laws in, in the country when it comes to that. So two types of people, an audiologist that's licensed to dispense, we call them dispensing audiologist, or a hearing aid dispenser. Other, uh, there's other types of temporary licenses but they must work under the supervision of an audiologist or a hearing aid dispenser. Now, in order to become, in order to, to become an audiologist, you must have a, doctor, a doctorate degree. So audiologists go through extensive training. They earn their, their doctorate of audiology degree. They have, in addition to that, 12 months of supervised experience before they become licensed and a minimum of 375 hours of clinical experience. Now they actually get a lot more than that. That's just the minimum that's required by law. Then they have to go and take a national examination. They come to us and they say, now I want to be, now I want to be able to sell hearing aids. What do I need to do? Well, we make them take a written exam. And after they pass a written exam, then they all come to Sacramento and we give them a hands-on practical examination. 
That's what a dispensing audiology um, has to do before, a dispensing audiologist has to do before they sell hearing aids. A hearing aid dispenser is a little bit different. Hearing aid dispensers are licensed to fit and sell hearing aids. Their educational requirement is they must have a high school diploma. The law doesn't require them to have any particular type of experience, but many of them do work as trainees, as apprentices. I know at Costco, they have a program where they actually train them. That's not necessarily the state's requirement. That's just something I think that, that they do. I know in talking to them. But before they become licensed, they have to take that same written examination and a practical examination. So this is why I say it's important to see who you're talking to, do your homework, look at their reviews, find out what kind of service they give to people, and most importantly, check their license at, on the Department of Consumer Affairs website. Find out for yourself, has there been any action taken? If you don't get your answers on there, give us a call. Send us an email and we can help answer your questions in those areas. Are there any questions so far regarding the educational requirements or anything on license verification? Yes. I think this is a very important part of what we do, so I want to make sure everyone understands. Yes, I, I heard that you're not yet, but a uh, law went by that we're going to be able to buy hearing aids over the counter. Would that be uh, people, I'm sure, like hearing aid dispensers? Or would it be an audiologist? Okay, so that's a very good question. I'm going to talk a little bit about the changing landscape of hearing aids. And I'll, talk, I'll share a little bit about what I know. Um, at, towards the end of the, the presentation. That's a very good question. Any other questions? Yes. Are we going in the direction of... Are we going to follow Great Britain and buy the uh, lenses and the glasses and the hearing aids off the wall? Um, same question about over-the-counter over hearing aids. Just off the, off the wall, like a uh, 99 cent store uh, glasses. Are you just going to 99 cent store? and you get your amplification hearing aid for nine dollars. I'll talk about the changing laws again, the law that was passed by, I think it was uh, Senators Warren and Grassley. Um, we'll get to that. Any other questions about license requirements or license verification? Okay, go on to the... Um, so in addition to getting licensed, a hearing aid dispenser or a dispensing audiologists must continue their education. Now this goes for all licensees. My wife is a registered nurse, so every two years she has to continue her education. And if any of you hold a professional license, you know this, you have to go back and you have to continue your education and make sure that you meet these requirements. A dispensing audiologist, question. yes. Why don't you answer her question? But because there's more information that I want to include on, I want to talk about the whole topic. Okay, I, I will. Over the counter hearing aids have, 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 have come, they're happening. But there's, there's a lot more to talk about there. So, a dispensing audiologist must have 12 hours of continuing education every year. That means that every year they have to make sure before they renew their license that they've, they've had 12 hours of continued education. An audiologist, has to have, that doesn't dispense, has to have 24 every two years, and a hearing aid dispenser, the same thing, 12 hours a year. So in addition to, to getting their license every year, they have to have a minimum of 12 hours a year. I know many of them do more than that every year to maintain their license. Now, let's talk a little bit about advertising. Um, because I, I want to just kind of stick with the topic of, of enforcement and consumer protection before we get to the changing landscape of, of hearing aids. Advertising is a... Yes, you a very good question. I'd like you to answer it if you can. I, I did answer the question. The, the law did change. I answered the question. The law changed. I did answer the question. I'm going to talk more about it. That is a really interesting question, and he is going to cover it. Now. 
Um, he wants to get through this part of the presentation. So I think right now it'd be a good idea to please hold all your questions on, and until he's done. Okay? Thank you. Okay, so when we go to when we start talking about advertising, this is a big this is a major issue with with a lot of areas of retail, not just hearing aids, but it is a major issue when it comes to hearing aids because there's a lot of uh, misleading advertising, some fraudulent advertising, and that's something that it is a real challenge for our board. We, again, I, as I mentioned, we have 10 people, and you have newspapers, major newspapers all over California. People still actually buy newspapers. People go online to read these advertisements. And these advertisements sometimes sell something, or they purport to sell something that is different from what they're actually trying to sell you. So, you know, to that I say buyer beware. The Business and Professions Code 651 forbids the dissemination of public communication containing false, fraudulent, misleading, deceptive claims. Now, I just put this as a foundation so that you, I know that all of you probably have a pretty good understanding of this. We've all lived through the, the going out of business furniture sale advertisements. We've all lived through the the advertising used cars and then doing a bait and switch technique. So these are some of the same kinds of um, activities that happen. A false and misleading deceptive statement is a misrepresentation of fact that's likely to deceive. So when we say we have uh, a hearing aid that is going to, um, it's the world's smallest and most potent hearing aid. Unless you can somehow quantify that, then that's a misleading advertisement. So. There, there are a lot, of, a lot of examples on how that happens. It, uh, an advertisement that makes a claim of professional superiority without objective and scientific evidence. That's what I was just talking about. Now, I don't know if any of you ever saw this movie. It's a movie about this elf that is walking through New York. And he walks through there and he sees, he's from obviously the North Pole in this story. He's never been through these, the city streets. And he sees this sign that says, the world's best cup of coffee. So he comes into this coffee place and he's just ecstatic. He says, you did it, congratulations. You created the world's best cup of coffee. Great job, everybody, it's great to be here. And the people in the coffee shop are looking at him like, <laughs> totally not understanding where he's coming from. But these are the kinds of claims that are sometimes made. There's misleading testimonials. We actually had a, a case where sometimes you have a, a great personality, a, a radio personality or news personality, and they're advertising about how great a hearing aid has worked for them when maybe they don't use hearing aids. Or, or they're not telling you, I'm actually getting paid to do this. The law says that they have to actually tell you that they're a paid spokesperson. They can't compensate them without telling you that. So I, I included some bulleted information in your materials so you, you can understand that. So be, beware of these, um, these advertisements that are out there. In addition to the advertising laws that, that protect you, we also have something called the Song Beverly Consumer Warranty Act. How many of you have ever, ever heard of the California Lemon Law? That's, that's something that's somewhat unique to us. Now, another booklet that we've included is a booklet called Lemonade. And it talks about the lemon law and how it applies to purchasing automobiles. This is a special law that's in the California Civil Code that has to do with, um, with appliances, with it has to do with cars. And what it is is it makes sure that, there, that there's an implied warranty in these laws. Well, the legislature thought that hearing aids were so important that they actually included a law that just applies to hearing aids in this consumer warranty law. And what it says is all new and used hearing aids sold in the state will be accompanied by a retailer's seller's written warranty. It even tells them the size font that that warranty needs to be in. It needs to be in at least a size 10 font. And the reason they did that was because, I don't know if you remember the, the Willy Wonka contract, as he's reading the contract, 
the letter is getting smaller and smaller, and he says, I can't even read this, it's too small. And he says, that's the point, sign here. Sometimes um, th those things happen in business, so the, the legislature wanted to make sure that it's at least in a 10-point font, so you could see that with your reading glasses. And what it says is, if this hearing device is not initially fit for the buyer's particular needs, it may be returned to the seller within 45 days of the initial date of the buyer. If you return the hearing aid, the seller can adjust the hearing aid without a charge and in a reasonable amount of time, they can replace the hearing aid or they can just promptly refund you the whole amount paid. When a sale is rescinded under this section of law, no charge or penalty or other fee may be imposed in connection with a purchase, fitting, financing, or return of the device. This is another area that we've actually had to enforce. We have cases where a hearing aid dispenser decides, you know, you need to, if you're going to buy this hearing aid, we're going to take you on a patient journey. So you're going to sign up for this great plan and it, it lasts a certain amount of time, four weeks, 60 days, whatever that is, and it's beyond the warranty period. So by the time you decide this doesn't work for me, you're outside of that warranty period and they're no longer legally obligated to refund you your money. So be aware that you, you know, there are specific laws that cover you when it comes to hearing aid warranty. Now, if you, Paul, yes, yes. So the, the state law is 45 days, right? That's correct. But there are some places that say you have 60 day, 90 day, six month warranty. If they put that in writing, is that good? Y yes, they can, they, can, they can extend the warranty as long as they want. Okay. But they're just, by law, they're only legally required to refund your money within those 45 days. Thank you. And, and I'll tell you from talking to hearing aid dispensers, most of them, that the, the reputable ones that I know would say, well, why wouldn't I want to work with my, with my clients or my customers? So most of them do that. Mike. Mike. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, so most of them are reputable and will, and will provide good service. Any other questions on that before we go to, so, if you feel that there has been a violation uh, of the law in any of these areas, um, I want you to know there's a way to file a complaint. And we have, this is our website, it's called speechandhearing.ca.gov. And the first thing we have on our website, right up at the top, under quick hits, is filing a complaint against a licensee. It's not because we're against licensees and because we think they're all bad. It's because that priority that we have, that we've been mandated, is consumer protection. That's why we're here. So we want to make sure that if someone has been wronged, has been legally wronged, that they have a way to come and file a complaint with the board. This, this kind of guides you and takes you through the pages of, of what to do. When you do file a complaint, there's several ways to to file a complaint form. We have an English version, a Spanish version, a way to go online so you don't have to print a piece of paper and send it to us. Or we have a specific hearing aids complaint form. And the reason we have a specific hearing aid complaint form is because there's specific information that we're trying to get when you file a, a, claim, a complaint against a hearing aid dispenser. Now, these are the kinds of violations that we will investigate. Um, sexual misconduct, conviction of a criminal offense, any practice outside of the scope of speech, language, pathology, audiology, or hearing aid dispensing, anything below their standards, deceptive or misleading advertising, um, unlicensed practice. The violations I mentioned include violations of the Warranty Act, these are the things that we do not investigate. We don't investigate fee or billing disputes. Now the only time we really get into the, the billing is when someone violates the actual Warranty Protection Act. So if you say, I request a refund, they will not refund me my money, it's, you know, I'm, I've tried to work with them, then at that point we will step in. We don't investigate personality conflicts. You know, the receptionist was really rude. Um, this, this person just is not very nice. 
Um, anything outside of our legal jurisdiction, we don't investigate. Um, just a real quick, if, if you have, has anyone here ever filed a complaint with the board against the licensee? If you do, um, we open the complaint. Um, th this is just kind of the process. It's a lot of information, but you can read this on your own. Basically, we open the complaint. We review it to see if it's within our jurisdiction. If it is, that complaint can go many directions. Sometimes it's a simple, you know, there's no violation here. This is outside of our jurisdiction. Sometimes it's a, it's a dispute that we can help uh, facilitate. We call the dispenser hey, give these people their money back, what's going on here, and sometimes that, that has happened. Sometimes it's more complicated than that and we need to actually involve an investigator or a subject matter expert. We go to our licensees sometimes who act as subject matter experts and we'll look at the records and say, is there a violation here? I have a question in the back, yes. Do you, um, can a patient file a complaint against a hearing aid dispenser who has signed themselves up as an audiologist on Yelp, number one, that they put down that they're an audiologist but they're only a hearing aid dispenser? And then the second question yes. is some of the current advertising, um, a local dispenser is saying that he is a hearing aid engineer, changing the title, is that? You know, how, does, how do you work with that? Well, the first one is, is very simple, and that, that is, yes, if they're, if they're claiming to be an audiologist and they're not, that's something that we would investigate. The, the second area, I think we'd have to look into that a little, a little more, but you can't mislead people into thinking you're something that you're not, or if it's a protected uh, class or license. I can't say I'm a doctor if I'm not a doctor. I can't make you think I'm a doctor if I'm not a doctor. So. The, those are the different routes. We've actually been very successful in prosecuting these cases. One case in Northern California involved five counties. Um, we, we were able to get restitution. That's the most important thing. People got their money back going all the way back to 2011. There's going to be a press release out on that that's going to be coming out shortly. It is public information, but people going all the way back to 2011 are going to be able to go back and get their money back from these people that basically rip them off. Um, now, there are some changes that are happening in, in hearing aids. Um, and the reason for this is because there, there's a problem, as, as Tony mentioned, here alone, we can assume that 50% of the people in this community have uh, are hard of hearing, is that what you said? So, so this is a great need in our country, and hearing aids have not always been affordable. Um, it's, a, it's a tremendous expense, and some people are covered, some people are not covered. Um, my wife who worked for Medi-Cal, she always kind of tells me, explains the laws to me, I don't always quite understand it completely, but, but it's a big problem. And I think this was a bipartisan bill by Senator Warren and Senator Grassley that was signed by the president in August as part of the FDA Reauthorization Act. And what this does is this, this directs the FDA to create regulations to create a new category of hearing aids that would be over the counter. Now, the law is directing the FDA to create regulations, so that has not happened yet but there will be over-the-counter hearing aids. And those over-the-counter hearing aids are gonna be for people that have self-perceived mild to moderate hearing loss. There's still gonna be a need for, for health professionals, for people to go to a, a licensed hearing aid dispenser or an audiologist that can do a test and a professional fitting, but this, the feeling is that this would still help a lot of people get some relief, get some improvement in their hearing. Now, 
we don't know how this is going to affect California yet. We don't know how it's going to affect a lot of states because the regulations themselves have not been written. I've been in communication with different um, agencies in Washington, D.C., trying to find out how is this going to affect us, what are we going to do. One thing I do know is that we, we have laws in place right now that say you have to regulate this, this profession, and we're going to continue doing that until we know otherwise. We know that there are going to always be licensed hearing aid dispensers and licensed audiologists that dispense hearing aids. Um, the other thing that's in the law that's important is that it's called the effect of state law that no state or local government can restrict or interfere with the over-the-counter uh, act, the part of that law. So we can't write a new law that says you can't sell over-the-counter hearing aids in California because this federal law supersedes that. The federal law trumps the state law, no pun intended there. Um, the effect on private remedies is that nothing in law shall affect the individual's right to legal action under any state or federal product liability tort warranty contract or consumer protection law. What does that mean? That means that a, a private citizen has a right to take legal action even after this law. Legal action enforcing their warranty contract or consumer protection rights. So the question we have is will this affect our California Consumer Warranty Protection Act and that's something that we don't know yet. I think that you'll probably find out because Tony is involved in some of the things that we do so she'll probably know and she'll probably pass that on to you. Um, we invite you to connect with our board. Uh, we we webcast our meetings. We're going to do a better job of getting, making sure that those meetings are available to people um, that need uh, closed caption or other, other requirements. Um, and we meet in October at Dominguez Hills. We usually have a couple of meetings in Northern California and at least one or two meetings in Southern California every year. We have a web address that's included in your materials. Uh, we have an email address. Um, feel free to send us an email and you can call us. We're working on getting more staff to answer those phones a little bit faster. So please be patient with us and bear, bear with us there. Now, are there any questions? Okay. Thank you. Any questions? The one thing I can say is that uh, it's kind of difficult to wade through all of the rules and regulations, but if you find advertising that you think is a little suspicious, you know, bring it here to the meetings. Let's take a look at it, and I can always run it by Paul. Uh, by the way, I think, it, uh, I don't know why I didn't mention this. Uh, I first uh, caught a glimpse of Paul when I was on uh, Capitol Hill. <laughs> when I was speaking before the assembly committee um, in favor of a, a, a new regulation to regulate, to require T-Coil um, instruction so that when you buy a hearing aid, uh, the plan was when you buy a hearing aid, the audiologist or hearing aid dispenser would have to tell you about it. That's all. Not that you have to have one, but that you would be informed about it and its use. Well, that's when I first saw Paul. Now, I didn't actually talk to you that day. I was scared to death. And, and one of the uh, board members uh, scared me to death. And uh, that's OK. I'm not afraid anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I have seen him subsequently, because I, I do try to go to the board meetings. And I will be at the board meeting in Carson on the 26th uh, and 27th. Um, and I have requested accommodations, so there will be captions for me at that meeting. And um, so I'm really looking forward to that. I will bring back new information, whatever that is, you know, from that board meeting. So I met you at a couple of board meetings. I met you at a audiology meeting. I think I may have met you at a hearing aid dispensers meeting. So anyway, so our paths have crossed a few times, which made it possible for me to invite him to come and talk to you. So, yeah. so anyway, so anything that is questionable in your mind, 
And um, if you don't want to go right to them and talk to them, um, you can certainly talk to me and we can write it out and, and get a message to uh, Paul Sanchez. <coughs> So your questions about over-the-counter hearing aids, has that been satisfied for right now? Yep. Everybody that was saying answer the question, answer the question. Because really there's, it's up to the federal government to write the regulations before we really know what else is going to happen. I get them on eBay for $6 a piece. I get six of them. They come and they're good for 10 They're good for uh, an, 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 They're good for no more than an increase on helping you 10 decibels and they're called hearing amplifications. Right. They're not hearing aids. That's they, they say this, go to your doctor for hearing aid, but this, is, this will help you 10% or, or 10 decibel at least. So you talk about PSAPs, yeah. personal sound amplification yeah. products. That's what's called a PSAP. They're not allowed to call it a hearing aid, yeah. uh, but eventually hearing aids that are manufactured that comply with the federal, the new federal law will be able to be called hearing aids. No, Tony, Tony, can I say something about that? Over the counter hearing aids. And it's anticipated that it'll be mostly mild hearing loss that will Can I add something to that, Tony? Sure. Okay, sure. Well, you know, you, you're really fortunate to have an audiology advisor here, too. And I think uh, one, one thing to really find out is what best meets your needs um, because. Uh, obviously, getting something um, out of a catalog or online may not be for everyone. So I think it's really important to consult with, with your audiology budget. Even as economical as it is, it, it, sometimes it's just like flushing it down the toilet if it doesn't work. You sometimes know, you, 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 pay for you get it. what you pay for. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> well, I've been following an ad that comes in the paper every week. It's called an empty hearing aid, and it has a picture of a, quote, doctor, whether he is or isn't. He doesn't mention the price. He doesn't mention whether it has any volume or uh, any other controls. And I'm wondering if that, you guys who are so smart, the two of you might know, is that uh, worth trying? She says money back guarantee or not. I've just been, every week I see this in our paper that comes. Seen them? It says MD hearing aid on it and a picture of the doctor, and you know, it's usually will, a full page ad. I, I will tell you my experience from looking at numerous ads is that if it's too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true. I mean, I, I hate to sound so skeptical, but there are a lot of good, reasonable options out there for hearing aids, and I'm, I would just be, be aware of those. Those no risk, money back guarantee type deals, just be careful. MD hearing aid sounds like a mail order place, it's not. <laughs> no, he calls himself a doctor and gives a website. So you have to order him from the website or do you make an appointment to see him? Go to the website, maybe find out more, or call on the phone. <coughs> that doesn't really sound like something I want to try out. So. My hearing loss is, is really the severe and the profound, so that definitely wouldn't work for me. Yes, Michael. Is there any timeline when these over the counter units will be coming out? I've been told different things. I've been told that the FDA, that it's going to take up to three years to get the regulations in place. But I've also been told 12 months. So I would probably guesstimate that it's somewhere in between there. But by the way, that started with the previous administration. So I don't know. what. There's a lot of uh, administrative changes that are happening. So I don't know how that affects these regulations. Okay, um, hearing units for me have been very expensive because I end up either misplacing them or losing them. And I just wondered if they, you know, the prices will ever come down. But because I know these new ones, these over the counter, that's not going to work for me because I have severe hearing loss. So I'm wondering is there something in between? I mean, 
we're seniors. I'll, and I'll with the, me, I know the oh. expert has something to say, but can I just? Say, I, I know one thing that I, that I've heard is likely to happen is you have a handful <laughs> of of companies, uh, manufacturers that have dominated the market, yeah. and there's a sense that with the over-the-counter hearing aids, with more companies getting involved, that that may affect the price and eventually long-term bring the prices down. In three years. Um, a lot of good points have been made. Number one, with the over-the-counter, they are working with the regulation, but it is made for mild slash moderate hearing loss. Most of you in this room would not qualify for that over-the-counter hearing aid because it wouldn't meet your needs. An over-the-counter hearing aid means just that, over-the-counter. You go into Walgreens or wherever and you buy it and you put it in your ear and that's it. Nobody's going to adjust it for you. Nobody's going to take your audiogram. It is a beginner type of hearing aid. So some of that amplification systems that you're talking about, they have not legally been able to call it a hearing aid, even though it does amplify the sound it's now allowing them to call it a hearing aid. The other thing is the reason hearing aids are so expensive, we know is research and development, but it's because our insurance companies don't pay for eyes, ears, and teeth. Medicare was set up to be a major medical insurance. It was not originally set up to be everyone's everyday health insurance. It has transpired into that, but that was not the original cause or reason for Medicare. So that's why it's so expensive, because it is an out-of-pocket expense. What we need to do is we need to write our senators and congressmen and tell them that if they would be proactive in helping with hearing loss, we could have, I think Paula was said at the CAA meeting, um, $13.1 billion savings in senior health care because there would be less falls, less hypertension, better cognitive skills. Hearing loss affects all of those things. And with seniors being so affected, we need to be proactive in trying to get that covered. No one says, oh, my hip replacement was way too expensive. My shoulder, oh my goodness. No, because your insurance pays for it. It's because you're feeling the pain of an out-of-pocket expense. I can appreciate where you're coming from, but it's not that the hearing aids, when you, when you entail the training and the therapy and everything else that you get with the hearing aid when they're properly fit, that's not the issue. The issue is that we need to go back and try to get hearing aids covered. We have had hearing aids now, cochlear implants are covered. Five years ago, cochlear implants were not covered by Medicare. Now that Medicare covers them, other insurance companies are covering them. And because of that, now it's just a degree of hearing loss, right? Now it's severe, so now they need to start bringing the standard down to cover moderate and severe, and they would save a lot in other health care areas. Sorry, got to get off my soapbox. <laughs> So right, 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 right. That was very good. I was wondering, I, I've never had a hearing aid. One is the cost, it's expensive to me. I don't know how much will cost. We're going to answer that one. She wanted to know how much a hearing aid costs. Well, you can go anywhere from $39.95 on the internet <laughs> all the way up to $3,000, $4,000 a piece, right? They'll vary. And that's where education comes in play. And as Paul was saying, you have to know what you're getting for your dollar, right? What is that technology doing? How does that person fit? What kind of therapy are you getting? There's a whole way that a hearing aid needs to be fit. and I like to equate it as being a physical therapist. If you got a knee replacement, would you think that you could just walk out the door on your own with no, adjust, no therapy, no physical therapy afterwards? Your body knows how to walk. Why do you need a physical therapist if you just had a knee or a hip replacement? 
Oh, the reason you do is because the therapist knows your body and they know how to push you to the point of accepting the new device and then getting used to it and teaching your body how to use that device properly. That is the purpose of an audiologist or a hearing aid dispenser after you have gotten fit, is to retrain your brain on how to hear, how to accept sound, how to apply it, and how to use it to the best of your advantage for what you have left. A hearing aid does not give you normal hearing. A hearing aid is an aid, it's not a cure-all. But it is a fantastic device when it's placed in your ear properly and fit properly. And that's where it is. Hearing aids are getting smarter because they can detect the difference between background noise and speech. But it's still up to the brain to do the work. Your brains are doing all the work. The hearing aid is only giving your brain the cleanest, clearest signal to process. So when you talk about the cost of a hearing aid, you're talking about how is that device separating the words from the background noise to give me a clean signal. You can buy a radio at Radio Shack. No, they're not in business anymore, are they? <laughs> you can buy a radio online for $4.95, or you can pay $15,000 for a beautiful stereo system. They both are giving sound, but the sound fidelity and clarity has to be appreciated. And that's basically what you're paying for in the variety of hearing. So does Medicare um, help now? Not yet. Okay, so what can we do? Uh, write to our senators because I think Medicare, there's, that's the feds, right? The, fed, the Medicare is our federal government. Right now, Medicare in theory, excuse me, right now Medicare will not pay for a hearing test. Hold up. Right now, Medicare will not pay for a hearing test if it's for the purpose of fitting a hearing aid, or if there's not a medical issue behind it, meaning an ear infection. Well, how do you know if you don't get tested, right? We don't. So we need to push that guideline, and we need to contact our congressmen and our senators and tell them we need help with this. And we can change, but we need to hear the voices, as Paul says, from, you know, when you make a complaint, then things get changed. Cochlear implants weren't on the, the scope five years ago, and now they're paid. So we can do it. Okay. Thank you, Anne. Yeah. Thank you. You go, girl. Yeah. I'll let it pass us all. And Paul, you want to tell people about what you brought them? Yes, please. There are some there there are some booklets in the back that we were able to bring from the Department of Consumer Affairs from some of the other agencies with the board. Um, there there are a lot of consumer protection boards out there that are there to help you. So we want to be of service to you. Please take a look at these. Thank you. Okay. So thank you, Paul. So very much. And the hearing well club wants to wants to give you a little gift. And we want to take a picture. <laughs> and it is a little gift. All right. There you go. All right. One, two, three. Uh, not even a handshake. What is it? <laughs> what is it? Thank you. There we go. Somebody hey, must have told you. <laughs> it's a, a gift card from Starbucks. <laughs> I love Starbucks. Um, Okay, if you've borrowed a listening device, please turn it in to the door monitor. We also have, if you've learned anything today, we have a donation jar. Please, please give to the best of your ability. Any amount counts. And our next meeting is in November, and I will send you an email if you've given me your email address. If you live in the Thula Woods and don't have an email address, I'll send you a postcard, but I, I need to have that information. Thank you very much.